Hi, this is Simon from Tokyo Productions and welcome to another tutorial to help you get started with Blackmagic Fusion 8. And today we're going to be looking at creating this landscape scene. Now I will be the first to admit that this isn't going to win any prizes for visual effects, but I've chosen this scene because it'll show off a number of interesting techniques that I think you'll want to try out. So let's get started. Now in the previous tutorial I showed you how you could add tools to your flow by clicking on the flow area, right clicking, add tool and then selecting from any of these. And that's a great way of finding out what's available inside Fusion. But it's a little bit of a slow method and I'd like to encourage you as you get more familiar with the program to use a different method and that's to hold down the shift key and then hit the space bar. And then that brings up this Add Tool menu. And all you have to do is to type the first few letters of the tool that you want. In this case, I want a background. So B-A-C-K will give me background. Hit Enter. I'm going to do it again. Shift Spacebar. I'm going to type Image for Image Plane. Do it again. Shift Spacebar. Displace. And I want Displace 3D. Right, let me just disconnect the background from the image plane. And let's look at the background in our left-hand viewer and the displace in our right-hand viewer. Now, the default color for the background is black, but I want to change that. So I'm going to click on the pick button there and I'm going to set it to white. And I'm also going to duplicate this background. so. Command C, Command V. Again, click on the Pick Color button, and I'm going to set this one to mid gray. I'm going to select my first background. Let's hit Command F to zoom out, and again, minus to zoom out a little bit more. And I want to add a simple rectangular mask, so I'm going to hit the rectangular mask button there. And I'm just going to move that mask over a little bit, and then just shrink it like so. And then I'll copy that mask, Command C, Command V, and add it to the effect mask input of the second background color. And let's look at that. Let's just select the mask and just move it over to the right. And then I'm going to take the output of the second background and pipe it over the output of the first background. And that automatically creates a merge of the two. So let's look at the result. So I've got a white rectangle and a mid-gray rectangle. So what I'm going to do with those is take the output of that merge and pipe it into the Displace tool, the Displace input. And if we turn on lighting and shading, we can see the result of that. The white has displaced the image plane a long way and the gray has displaced it about half the distance because it's a mid-gray. So clearly, the greater the value of the image, the more displacement we'll get. So you can probably see that this displacement is looking a bit rough and approximate. And we can fix that by coming to the image plane and increasing the subdivision level. So let's enter a value of 150 and see the difference. And immediately we've got these nice crisp cubes and that's much better. And that's because we've got a lot more polygons for the Displace tool to work with. And I think you can think you can probably see that this technique allows you to build some fairly easy geometry simply by setting different values for your input image. But we want to be doing something a little bit more interesting than cubes. So let's delete most of this and detach our background. And let's hit Shift Spacebar and type Fast Noise. And we want the second item in that list, not the Fast Noise texture. And let's hit Enter. Now, if I pipe the Fast Noise into the displace, let's see what happens. You'll see we get this very interesting textured result. I'm just going to select the image plane and I'm going to come to its transform and I'm going to rotate it on X, so minus 90 on X. 
and that'll just turn it into a ground plane. Let's switch to the single viewer mode so we can see this a little bit more clearly. And let's come to the fast noise, and I just want to show you how the different elements interact. So as I reduce the brightness, you can see that I'm contriving to squash down the floor. As I increase the contrast, I'm pushing up the peaks. And you, you'll see that at a certain point they hit a threshold. And that threshold is simply the displace scale value. So you can see how all these elements interact to create the final result. So there's an issue here with what's happening with the edges of the image plane. We've got these strange gaps in it. Well, let's switch back to the dual view, and I just want to add a mask to the fast noise. So let's view the mask on the left-hand viewer. Let's command F to fit it, and then minus to zoom out just a little bit more. I'm going to deselect the fast noise by clicking on the flow area. I'm going to select the add polyline mask tool there, and I'm just going to click and drag to create a shape. And then I can pipe that into the effect mask input of the fast noise, and let's look at what happens. So that's cleared up the edges of the image plane, and that's good. So we could come to the polygon mask and simply increase the soft edge just to smooth out those very sharp corners there at the bottom. But while we're here, I just wanted to point out that there is another way of softening off the mask, and that's a much more sophisticated one. And that's if we hit the Make Double Poly tool there, and that's the double D. If we now command click on any of these control points, we can soften it asymmetrically, so we can have different softness at different points, and that's a, a very useful feature. We probably don't need it in this case, but I just wanted to take the opportunity of pointing that out. Let's just turn off the double poly, and let's just go with standard soft edge. So what we can do at this point is come back to the fast noise and adjust the various parameters to taste, so we can reduce the scale, and we can reduce the contrast, and I think I'll also come back to the displace value and just reduce that down a bit. So what we can also do is have a more complex contour map. So this is the contour map over on the left here. Let's select both the polygon and fast noise. Command C, Command V to paste them. Let's look at the second fast noise over here on the left. And let's just change its scale so we've got more complexity there. But let's reduce the contrast. And now what we can do is we can grab that fast noise output and pipe it onto the output of the first fast noise. And then if we look at the merged result, you'll see it's something a little bit more interesting. And over here in our displace, again, we've got a slightly more complex arrangement where we've got lower peaks. And we could take the polygon mask for the second one and change the way that works. So we clear out that section in the middle, and so on. Don't want to spend too much time on this, I just wanted to point out how you can create a, a more elaborate and interesting uh, result by blending various different fast noise elements together. What we can also do is take our background colour here, and let's just add another polyline to it. I'm going to just draw something around here, like that. Add that to the effect mask for the background. It's going to change the background color to a mid gray like this and then let's merge it over the other merge by dragging its output to the merges output and you'll see that that's created this level platform here we could uh, take the polygon mask and soften the edge of it so i'm just going to add a black background so add another background and i'm going to merge the merge over the background and just in order to show you what our contour map is actually looking like and how it's working. And there you can see that black represents no displacement, and white represents maximum displacement, and mid-grey, which is our platform area here, represents sort of intermediate displacement. If I come back to that background that's creating the platform and adjust its alpha channel, you can see that the underlying colour is now pushing through, and I've broken up that platform. So 
lots of very interesting options for you to build your own geometry here and I'll leave you to do that. And now let's look at texturing it. So I'm going to add tool, that's shift spacebar, type loader, come to my textures folder, I'm going to select rock and bring that in. And that looks a bit like this, so it's a elaborate rock texture. And I'll put a link to this and the other textures we're using in the comments. So let's just very crudely pipe the rock texture into the image plane and see what happens. Okay, uh, you can probably see that what's happened is that it's being stretched along the verticals. That's really not ideal, I don't think. So how can we map this in a different way? Well, to do that, we're going to select the Displace tool, which is our final output. Let's just create something to differentiate our mesh work here. And I'm going to right click, add tool, flow, underlay. And you'll see that it brings up this underlay option and I can drag that out. And then that just sort of differentiates that section there and helps me to see what's going on. OK, so as I say, I'm going to select my displace tool. I'm going to hit shift space bar and type UV and I'm going to look for the UV Map 3D tool. And that'll come on the end of the displace. So let's just look at that on the viewer. Well, that looks even worse, but that's because what we need to do is we need to select camera projection. So under here, under map mode, I'm going to select camera. Right, and then obviously we need a camera to project the texture. So shift space bar, camera, 3D. And I'm going to pipe that camera into the UV map camera input. So our camera is sitting right on top of our geometry, so we need to move it back on the Z axis. So I'm simply going to come to its transform here and enter a Z offset of two. And if we zoom out, you can see how that camera is now projecting that texture onto the geometry. And depending on how close we are, Let's just adjust the offset there. You can see we get greater or lesser coverage. Now there is an issue that we are now stretching the material along the Z axis, but I don't think in, in this case it's going to be matter too much because we're not going to move around quite so much to the side that we're going to notice that. We might, however, worry about what the floor is looking like with these very obvious stripes on it. And to adjust that, we'd need to adjust the angle at which the camera is projecting onto this geometry. So let's just have a look at that. Select the camera, come to its transform here. I'm going to twirl open the pivot because I want to show you something quite useful that I use a lot. I like to have the Z pivot value to be exactly the same as the Z offset value, but a negative version of the same. So I'm going to show you a very simple way of linking the two. Let's select the Z pivot and let's hit the equals sign and hit enter. And you'll see this brings up this cross here. And what I can do is I can drag from that cross onto the slider for the Z offset. And you'll probably now notice that the Z pivot value is the same as the Z offset. But what if I want to make it a negative of the same value? So if I come to the front of this link message here and enter a minus sign, you'll see that that simply inverts it and I've got a minus value for the pivot. So now as I change the Z offset, you can see the Z pivot updates accordingly. And that's a very, very handy little trick. We'll have a look at expressions in a bit more detail in, in subsequent tutorials, but I just wanted to show you that. And the value of this is we can now adjust the X rotation. So I'm going to enter a value of minus 10, so we're looking down. And you can see that as we increase that negative value, the more we're looking down and the more we're covering that floor. So actually probably a value of about minus 30 is going to be right for this. So let's go about adding a proper material to this rock. Let's select the rock texture there, add tool, and we'll look for blin. Add that. Let's come over to the blin and open up the specular. And rocks are not nearly this shiny. So let's just bring the specular value way, way down. Almost nothing, I think. Let's now bring in a background. So loader, and I'm going to look for my sky texture and open that up. 
then I'm going to type image for image plane and bring that in and let's have a look at the sky. Let's just use this Y control to bring it up so it's sitting level with the grid floor. And then let's twirl open the pivot here and select the Y pivot. Again, let's do our linking trick. So equals to bring up the expression, drag the cross onto the Y offset value there. And let's enter a minus sign at the head of that. And what that means is that when we scale the sky, it's scaling from the bottom edge. And that makes life a little bit easier. I'm going to enter a value of 20 because we want a seriously big sky. We're not bang on the floor, but it doesn't matter. It's close enough for our purposes. So now we want to add it to our main scene. So I'm going to take the image plane and I'm going to drag its output onto the output of the UV map. And that will create a merge 3D. And let's look at the result of that on our right hand viewer. Let's zoom out. I'm going to take this image plane and I'm also going to move it back a long way on Z. So let's go for minus 10. And then I'm going to add a tool to it. So shift space bar and I'm going to type bender and we'll add that. Let's select X for the axis. Let's select 90 degrees for the angle. And then we can just bend it round like that. So we've got this sky way off in the distance. I'm just going to select this image plane and come to its lighting. And we want to turn off affected by lights because the sky doesn't want to be lit. So let's now add a camera to this scene. Select the merge there, shift spacebar, camera. And that's added a camera in there. And then also let's select the Merge 3D. And as you probably remember, we need a renderer on the end of that. So Shift Spacebar Renderer 3D. Let's look at the Renderer 3D output. Let's come to the camera controls. To open the pivot, we want to do the same trick with the Z pivot. So equal sign in the Z pivot value. Drag from the cross onto the Z offset. And we want to enter the minus sign in front of the expression there. And then let's enter a Z offset value of 1.5. So now when we rotate on Y, we're rotating easily around the rock. It's much, much easier to work this way, I find, because the pivot is located right in the center of the scene. Let's reset all of that. Let's now come to the material for the rock. And remember we added a blin. I want to add another material after that. So add tool and I'm going to type reflect and I'm going to add this reflect shader. And what I can now do is I can take the sky texture and I can pipe it into the reflection color material of the reflect. And you can probably see what that's done is that that's now reflecting the sky in the rocks. So this is slightly crude and we need to refine that a little bit. And to do that, we are going to add another tool. So shift space bar coordinate, coordinate space. And I'm going to pipe the sky into the coordinate space. And just let's have a look at how that looks. So that's what it did look like. This is what it now looks like. So now this is more correctly formatted to act as an environment map for our reflection. But we need to do a couple of extra things first of all. First of all, I need to chop off these spikes along the top. And to do that, I'm going to add a crop tool. So shift spacebar crop. Let's look at the crop output. Now we need to just hover over the sky here and just check its frame size. So its width is 1500 pixels. So let's come to our crop tool here. What it's done is it's entered the default X and Y values from our preferences. So instead of an X size of 1920, I'm going to enter a value of 1500. And you can see the difference that that makes. It's, we've lost this space at the side here. So 1500. And then all we need to do is adjust the Y size downwards till we lose those peaks at the top. So something like that. 
Now let's pipe that output into the reflection input, so replacing the original one. So put it in there and let's look at the reflect texture. Remember that this creates this ball here and if we hold down the middle mouse button and drag you can see we can look at the lighting. So that's not too bad. It's not quite right and actually what we should be doing is adding an extra tool after the crop. So shift space bar and I'm going to type sphere and I get the sphere map and that will just map it more correctly for the reflection. So the nature of our rock geometry is that you probably can't really see how this reflection is working or not working. So let me just explain it in a little bit more detail. I'm going to add another tool, Shape 3D, and I'm going to pipe our reflection material into it so we can just have a look at how that works. And I'm going to select Cube. Let me just come to the reflection and let's turn the face strength all the way up so we get a completely reflective cube. And I think you can see how that sky reflection is actually working pretty well. If we come right to the bottom and we can see how it's pinching in towards the bottom, but we're not going to be looking at it from that angle. And from every other angle, it looks pretty good. Now, if you know anything about environment maps, you'll know that what I've done here is a bit of a cheat. What you'd normally have is an image that looked like this, which had been extrapolated from an image that looks like this, which has been shot with a chrome ball. And typically this would be HDRI, you'd have shot multiple exposures, you'd have combined them, and so on. And the nature of this, of course, is that we're seeing a genuine 360 view of our environment. But you don't always have the luxury of shooting a chrome ball or having indeed an environment that is suitable. So. I, th I think this is a, a fairly handy little trick for simulating the effect of that. The key is using the coordinate space to create this very different mapping that enables us to then use a sphere and get a decent environment. So I hope any purists among you will forgive this cheat. I think it's quite, quite useful and it's certainly good enough for our scene. So let's set everything back to normal and carry on. OK, so now let's add some lighting. So let's select the Merge 3D tool here. Let's add to Spot to add a spotlight. That's down here. Let's come over to the Renderer, come to the Lighting, and enable Lighting and Shadows. Let's select the Spotlight, come to its Positional Controls. Let's move it to minus 1 on X, and rotate it through minus 90 on Y. So it's lighting up the scene from the left-hand side. And we can probably move it up a little bit on Y as well. Come to its controls. Let's open up the cone angle all the way. Let's again select the Merge tool and add another light. So Shift Spacebar. I'm going to type Ambient for Ambient Light. And this we can turn way down, so to about 0.1 maybe 0.2, just to give us a nice little fill for the rest of the scene. Let's select our camera, come to its position, and let's just move it up a little bit on Y. So we're looking down a little bit at the scene. So we're nearly finished with part one of this tutorial, but I'd just like to come back to the texture for the rock and look at giving it a bump map. So first of all, I'm going to add a brightness contrast. Brightness Contrast, add that. I'm going to pipe the rock texture into that. Let's have a look at that on here. First of all, I'm going to reduce the saturation down to zero, and then I'm going to increase the low value to 0.5. So it's crunched it down a lot. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a Create Bump Map tool. So Create Bump Map, add that. And after that, I'm going to add a Bump Map tool. And then I'm going to pipe the result into the Bump Map input of the Blin. We need to come to the Bump Map material here. We need to select this source as being Bump Map because obviously we've used our Create Bump Map node there to actually turn it into a genuine Bump Map. 
Let's increase the height scale on the Create Bump Map up to 2. And then what I want to do is I want to add a blur just after the Brightness Contrast. So select Brightness Contrast, Add Tool, Blur. And that just helps to soften off the edges of the bump. You can see it's all a little bit speckly there. If I enable the blur, we get a, a better result. We can increase the bump map height scale just to taste. Maybe four will do. And that process has given us a much better result than just, for example, if we'd piped the rock texture directly into the bump map. That would have been using height map there. It doesn't look nearly as good. This slightly more complex procedure is giving us a much nicer, more rock-like result. And one final trick before we go while well, we're still looking at the rock surface here. I'm going to take the rock displace and I'm going to add another displace on the end of it. So displace 3D. I'm going to just turn the scale down to 0 0.01. And then I'm going to take that rock texture that we added the brightness and contrast to. So the output of the brightness and contrast, and I'm going to add it to this new Displace 3D. And I think you can probably see that that's greatly enhanced the appearance of the rock, giving it a lo lot more interesting displacement. And what's happening is that whereas our original displacement is just happening vertically, this is happening on a different axis and is giving us a much more organic looking result. So that's well worth having a play with as well. So that's about it for part one. In part two, we'll be looking at finishing off the scene and in particular adding the C in the foreground. So I hope very much you can join me for part two. Thanks very much for watching.